ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد ان شاء الله we're still talking about the, the type of najasa and um, last week we finished with the urine or and the, the the dung of animals that are inedible so this would apply to obviously what we talked about um, donkeys mules uh, predator animals whether they're um, land animals or whether they're birds um, dogs pigs and so on so all these are the things that are inedible um, and we said that the only or that the one that there's essentially no disagreement about um, is the, uh, the the dung and urine of a pig so this is and the rest we said uh, that um, Allah Alam would the stronger opinion seems to be that it's that they would be considered Tahir and we talked about the evidences for that um, so this week inshallah we'll begin with talking about where the author left off which is talking about animals that are edible so whether it's a cow or a sheep or a chicken or anything like that um, so this is what we'll be talking about today so I'll just I'll begin with reading what the author says he says as for the urine and stools of animals whose meat is permissible Malik Ahmed and a group of the Shafi'iya say that it is pure commenting on the subject Ibn Taymiyyah says none of the companions held that it is impure in fact the statement that it is impure is of recent origin and none of the early generations of, of the companions or and not from the earlier generations um, of the companions so he's saying he's mentioning what Ibn Taymiyyah said that the uh, opinion that um, the urine and, and stools of, of these animals is najas is something that came later on and then so the author continues he says Anas said <coughs> a group of the people or a group of people from the tribes of uh, Ukal or Urayna um, came to Al Medina and became ill in their stomachs. So the Prophet ﷺ commanded them, or he ordered them to um, get a milking she camel, so meaning a, a, a camel that was uh, feeding her young at the time, um, and to drink a mixture of its um, the urine and the milk, or the milk and the urine from this animal. Um, so he mentions this hadith, and then he says. Um, uh, this hadith is related by Ahmed, Al-Bukhari, and Muslim, um, and points uh, to a camel's urine being pure. Therefore, by analogy, uh, another permissible animal's urine may also be considered pure. Ibn al-Mundir said, those who claim that it was permissible only for these people are incorrect. Uh, specification is only uh, confirmed by a specific proof. And then he says, the scholars permit, without any objection, the sale of the stool uh, and use of sheep stool and camel's urine in their medicine both in the past and in the present again without any objection um, this shows that they are considered pure and then Imam al-Shawkani says the apparentness or the dhahir is that urine and dung from any animal that is alive and or uh, and permissible to eat is pure and then the author says there is nothing to prove otherwise so this is what the author mentions about this topic which is the the uh, the purity or najasa of animals that are edible, or the, the, the urine and the dung from them. So uh, I'll just mention a bit about what the author, or add a bit to what the author talked about. So first on this topic, there's three opinions about um, this topic, about edible animals. The first is that it's considered tahir, and this is what the author mentioned. Um, and this is the opinion of the Malikiya and the Hanabila, as the author said, and it's also the opinion of Dawood ibn Ali, um, and others. So, uh, who was the Imam of uh, the Zahiriya, or the first Imam of the Zahiriya? So, the arguments that they use is the same things that the author mentioned. So, this hadith of Anas radiallahu anhu, that when these people came to Al Medina, the Prophet ﷺ told them to drink uh, a mixture of the of the camel's urine and and uh, and milk as a, a means to uh, or a cure or a medicine for their stomachs. So, this shows that the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have uh, permitted them to drink it um, if it was considered impure and like uh, the author mentioned from Ibn al-Mundir that if someone wants to say well yes we say that the Prophet ﷺ told these people to drink it but this was something only specific to them then this is something that we reject because as a rule that you you know we should keep in mind is that anything that's come in the Sharia we, we take it as general 
unless there's something to prove that it's specific. So if the Prophet ﷺ is asked about something and he, sa- and, and, and he says that it's permissible, we can't then come and say that um, you know, it's not permissible for everyone, it was only permissible for this person because the Prophet ﷺ was sent to everyone um, and the Sharia is for everybody. Um, so when the Prophet ﷺ forbids something or permits something, it's considered for the whole Ummah unless we have something to show that no, this was actually only for this person. So this is something um, uh, that we need to keep in mind. Um, and this is how this hadith would be used. So they mention this hadith and they mention a number of other things. So the first evidence that they use is um, hadith from Jabir ibn Samura that he's, that the Prophet ﷺ was asked, or this hadith is from Jabir ibn Samura that a man asked the Prophet um, should I perform wudu after eating lamb meat so they, he said perform wudu if you wish and don't, don't perform wudu if you do not wish so then he said should I perform wudu from eating camel's meat and he said yes perform wudu from eating camel's meat so then the, he continued this questioner and he said May I offer my salat, or may I may I perform my salat in the sheep folds, or you know the the pens in which the sheep are kept? And he said yes. Um, and then he said, should I can I perform my salat where the camels are kept? And he said no. And this hadith is narrated by Muslim. So the way this is used is that the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith permitted um, this person, or he he gave the permission when the, when he was asked by this person about praying. I'm in the areas where sheep are kept and he said yes so they say obviously where sheep are kept they're going to urinate and defecate um, you know and anyone who's been to a farm knows that this is the case that it's not possible to clean it out and even what is possible isn't always done so the the waste that's left behind by these animals is ke- is you know everywhere um, and s- but th- when the Prophet ﷺ permitted them to permitted him to um, pray in this area then this shows that it would be pr- that it's it would be considered tahir because we can't pray in an area that's full of najasa and then the second part of the hadith about doing so in the area of the camels we see in the other hadith from Anas that uh, he permitted them to actually drink it so we know it's tahir so what does that leave us with that there's some other reason why we can't pray in the area of uh, where the camels are kept and that we'll get into that at a different er- in a different time but the point is we have from these two hadiths the evidence that it's permissible or that the urine of camels and that the urine of sheep are both considered tahir um, as well as you know their their dung would be considered you know the same thing because it's both uh, it's both from the same animal and it's both coming from a waste from food and so on okay both of these hadiths are authentic yeah they're both uh, uh, they're both in Sahih. Well, the, the the one about the sheep and the camels is in Sahih Muslim, and the other one is in Sahih Muslim, and I think it's in Bukhari. It's uh, sorry, it's in Bukhari. Okay, so to use it as medicine to mix it with milk, the urine of a camel, is tahir. Yeah. But you cannot pray if you had urine or dung of a camel in the same room. In other words. No, because the hadith doesn't say that it, you can't pray in that area because of the urine. The, it says don't pray where these camels are. So if someone was going to say, well, no, that's because of the urine, we'd say, well, no, there's no mention in it that it's because the place is dirty. So that just leaves us with that there's some other reason that we shouldn't pray there. So with camels, no, but with the, with the sheep, it's fine? Yeah, we're allowed to pray but in their said areas. It's, it's where, they, where they're being held, so? Yeah. So what else could it mean? Just that, we, that he told us we, to not do it there. So, like, I mean, when he, I mean, if he tells us don't, then we... If it's something that we can understand the meaning, then we would say, well, this is the reason. And if it's something that we can't, or we, that we don't know the reason, then we just say, well, we and don't, you know, we don't know the reason. The first part of the hadith is about uh, if, if he eats from lamb, he doesn't have to make wudu. Or if he wants to, he can, but he doesn't have right. to. And from camel, it's a must. Yeah. This is the same hadith yeah, as yeah. the one pray, playing in, um, mm-hmm. praying in the pen. Right. So there's some, I mean, there's, there's some... something there, but we don't know. There's something, I mean, some of the scholars have, have tried to explain it. Some say that the reason is because there's another hadith that they, that mentions that they were created from shayateen. So some, s- and then there's different explanations as to what that means. Like some say that literally they were, and others say 
you know, that they have Shayaplin with them, um, you know, around them, and others say that what it means is their attitudes are very similar, their personalities, I guess you could call it, is very similar in their behavior, that they're very um, quick to become upset, and so on. So they say that this is, I mean, some of them say this is the reason, others say that the reason is because if a camel sits down, it's very, very tall, right? So if someone needed to cover themselves while they were urinating, mm -hmm. like from you know, um, cut like uh, from people, they could hide behind a camel, right, while it was sitting, and then go to the washroom, as opposed to a sheep. If a sheep was sitting, I mean, everyone would see you. So it could, there could so be some human. <coughs> there could be. So that's one other thing. And another reason that they say is because um, sheep are very calm, as opposed to uh, as opposed to camels. Camels are likely to just start running around. Or they're very um, agit uh, they they can become agitated very easily, which would take someone's khushua out of their salat if they were praying in that area because at, at any point these these animals could start you know uh, spit on you. I mean they they're very you know like they're very as opposed to a sheep they're very slow and they're docile and they kind of um, so if there is, so if the hadith didn't exist about uh, you know it's taher to eat their meat and it's taher to drink their urine uh, because he told them to mix it with milk for medicine. Uh -huh. Then we could assume that it's najis, but because of these two hadiths, then we can say it's taught. Even even if it if it didn't exist, then we would say it's still upon someone to bring us evidence that it's so, najis. Yeah, because so, it's taught until it's najis. Yeah, so I mean, but that's kind of. Sorry, I, I don't want to drag this on too no, no. far, but uh, what's do you have the hadith about the shayateen memorized or no? As as far as I know, it's authentic. Okay. And just as the Prophet said, um, that they they were cre they were created from shayateen. The camels? Are yeah. From yeah. Shayateen or from, uh, Shayateen. from like, the same creation? Yeah. From fire. From Shayateen. Yeah. Um, so this is the fir this is a set another evidence that they use to show that, that this waste is, is, is considered Tahir. Another is a hadith from uh, Abdullah bin Abbas that he said, طاف النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في حجة الوداع على بعير يستلم الركن بمحجن. Or the hadith from Abdullah bin Abbas that he s narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Performed tawaf in the farewell Hajj, um, so he was, you know, he during his in the last Hajj. So I mean, he only did it once, but so in the in the last year of his life, he performed tawaf during the farewell Hajj on the back of his camel, and he touched the corner um, with a stick. Um, and this is uh, it's a hadith that's agreed upon. So it's narrated by Al Bukhari and Muslim agreed upon, and this is Al Bukhari's phrasing. So we take from this that the Prophet Sallam rode this camel during his tawaf. So instead of walking, he, he used the camel. Um, and this was in the masjid, and not only it's the masjid, it's in the masjid al-haram. And it's, there's no way of guaranteeing that this animal wouldn't be relieving themsel himself while in the masjid, while the Prophet ﷺ was performing tawaf. Especially if we know um, tawaf, you know, you're, you're going around the Kaaba seven times, um, and in, in, the, in this time of the Prophet ﷺ, in this, in this, when he performed hajj, this was the last year of his life, so the number of Muslimin that were present was was more than any other year. So the likelihood that this didn't take place during this time is very very low. Um, so they use this as evidence as well, and because even if there was this, the possibility of this najasa coming into the masjid, especially the masjid al-haram, it's very unlikely that the Prophet if we if we could even say that it's impossible that the Prophet would take this animal into the masjid with this possibility that it would relieve itself in the masjid because even now n none of us would if if we had a, a baby we wouldn't bring the baby into the masjid knowing that there's a good possibility that it's going to you know urinate everywhere and that's us in in, in this masjid how about the prophet sallam in the masjid al-haram it's it's so i mean this so, is a quite a strong evidence so the conclusion that they it will relieve itself in masjid al-haram the camel or no that if it doesn't it does it's, it's almost it's almost for sure it will yeah, so a camp, but he was on a camp, right? Yeah, so he but performed. Agree he can't pray there, where they're kept. In the area. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So riding it as though is different because we know, <laughs> we know the Prophet said and prayed uh, while traveling. He would pray on the on the back of his. Not their uh, urine or uh, stool. That's. Uh, because yeah, I mean, because he wouldn't then say, well, it's haram to pray in this because it's najis, but then bring it into actually into the masjid oh. to go everywhere, right? That's so this shows. Uh, so that that proves there's something to do with something where extra. Show. Yeah, so yeah. it's not it's not oh, the oh, urine oh, itself, oh, yeah, that. or the camel even itself. It's something to do with because he wouldn't have prayed on it. Yeah, or how, they, uh, how would he use it for tawaf? Yeah, and in other narrations, like we'll get to in, in the like when we talk about salat, 
that for the Sunnah Salat, the Prophet ﷺ would pray on the back of his camel. Um, he would turn it towards the Qibla and perform takbir, and then he would go wherever the camel, like upon the path. This one's amazing evidence yeah. for that. Yeah. Yeah. But the yeah. hadith about the <coughs> doing tawaf with it. Yeah. That shows that the, what we're trying to get at is that it's po- very quite possible that it really did stuff in the haram, right? For sure it would have, yeah. yeah I mean, for like, sure it would have. So then like even you see animals while they walk, they just go. Like, I mean, it's not... And people pray in the haram, so that shows that people may be praying amongst... Her, and amongst the Prophet Sallam wouldn't bring it into the masjid if it, if if it was going to... If, if it was najis, yeah, knowing if, if, that it's going to do this. If it's so najis, he wouldn't bring it inside the masjid, knowing it might really be Because we're actually ordered, like we talked about last week, I think, or in the week before, that Allah Subh'ala Ta'ala ordered... Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and Ismail to purify the house of Allah. Mm-hmm. So how could we say that we're supposed to purify it, but not we're not going to do that? We're actually going to bring Najasa into it. It's impossible that would, they would do that. So this is the second evidence that they mention. The next hadith that they mention um, is a hadith from Abdullah bin Abbas that he said. Um, قيل لعمر بن الخطاب حدثنا من شأن uh, حدثنا من شأن الساعة العسرة فقال عمر خرجنا إلى تبوك في قيد شديد فنزلنا منزلا أصابنا فيه عطش حتى ظننا أن رقابنا ستنقطع حتى أن أن كان الرجل ليذهب يلتمس الماء فلا يرجع حتى يظن أن رقبته ستنقطع حتى أن الرجل ينحر بعيره فيعصر فرثه فيشربه ويجعل ما بقي على كبده so this is a hadith from Abdullah bin Abbas that he said, someone said to Umar, tell us about the hour of difficulty. And the hour of difficulty is referring to uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, t- talking about the Sahaba and, and, and praising them, that they were the ones who followed the Prophet ﷺ in the hour of difficulty or the hour of distress, which was when they went to uh, Tabuk, because Tabuk was so far and when they went was, you know, extremely extremely hot and they were going to a place they weren't fleeing to a battle they were actually going through all this hardship to actually get to somewhere to fight so this the sahaba so this is what it's referring to and and um you know i'm sure it'll end up being talked about in the sira in the sira lessons but anyway um so when omar was asked this he said we went out to tabuk to tabuk in the scorching heat then we reached an area where we were struck by thirst to the point where uh, we thought that our necks would be cut. So they were so thirsty that their, you know, their throats were so dry. They fe- it felt like this was gonna, you know, they they wouldn't be able to survive. And like that's the pain that they felt there was so severe. And he said it was to the point where a man would go out and he would not return until they were looking for water and he would not come back until he thought that his his throat was going to be cut, so uh, or his neck was going to be cut. So he would, the only reason that would bring him back to the camp was because he couldn't take it anymore. Um, and this is while they're looking for water. So it shows you how severe it was that instead of continuing to look, it was so bad that they thought it was actually easier to come back to the camp. And then, he's, and then so here's, and then here is the part of the hadith that's relevant to this topic. He says, and it was to the point where a man would slaughter uh, his camel and, and take out the dung from the animal and squeeze it um, in order uh, to get the water so that he would, and then drink it. And then he would take anything that was left and he would put it on his stomach. So meaning to cool off his stomach. So th- this this hadith um, it's uh, uh, it's it's narrated by Ibn Khuzaimah and Ibn Hibban and it's an authentic hadith. Um, so this shows the way the scholars use this is they say um, it's per- we know that it's permissible to eat something or drink something haram in order to keep yourself sustained. Um, so the Sahaba drinking this water doesn't prove that they considered it tahir, except for when they would take the rest and put it on their body. So this shows because putting it on their body in order to cool themselves off wouldn't necessarily keep them alive. It wasn't something that if they didn't do this, they would die, while the drinking would. So when they drank this, um, shows that they were only doing this because they needed to survive, but when they went further and did something to, in order to comfort themselves or bring themselves some sort of um, uh, relief, this shows that they considered it tahir because they wouldn't take something najas, and then um, uh, do this. They wouldn't go beyond what was actually necessary to keep themselves alive, um, in order to um, just to, to to relieve themselves from some of the stress. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was with them, and he didn't say anything in order to tell them um, that they were wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So just drinking it would be one thing, like saying, saying. Um, 
you know, I, if I don't drink something, I'm going to die. That wouldn't, because we know we can eat khanzir and we know we can drink wine if it's going to keep us alive. Only because, but then we could, if we couldn't then take the khanzir and start putting it on our body, like, you know, doing something extra with it or eating more than we needed um, just because we were originally needing to do it. So we can only go to what would keep us alive, um, you, know, you know, because of the necessity. But to go beyond that wouldn't be allowed. So the fact that they did, the Sahaba did this and the Prophet ﷺ was there and he didn't make any inkar on them or he didn't say that they were doing something wrong or anything like that shows that they understood that this was um, considered tahir. Um, so this is another... Where, where from in the camel they were getting that water? From their, the dung, from the from the, the feces. So they would squeeze they would squeeze it to get any, any remaining water out of the bo- out of what was left. And this shows, like, you know, on a separate topic, just how great the Sahaba were, that they put themselves in this harm not to get something from the dunya. They were actually going somewhere knowing that there's a very good chance I'm going to die and be killed, but I'm going to go through this hardship to actually get there. So as, oppo- as opposed to now, people would, wouldn't even go that far to get dunya. They were going further than, than what we would go now, knowing I'm probably going to be injured or probably going to, you know, be killed. Because they were going, to, you know, they were they were going to the, the furthest place, and so this just, you know, if people keep this in mind, it shows where the Sahaba were from where we were or from where we are now. So this, they mention this. They also mention, um, like uh, like Sami mentioned about the the birds in the Haram, that ever since the time of, you know, f- from you know, you know, a thousand years or more, there's always been these birds in the Haram. And the, it's it's pigeons. So if you go there, you see there's pigeons everywhere. Um, and there's never been an effort by anyone from the time of the Sahaba of any birds that were there, or for up until our time now, to get these birds out of the Haram. Despite the fact that they, you know, they would, I mean, you know, they, they'll they'll ur- there'll be urine and there will be feces from them. So the fact that all of the Muslimin never had a problem with this from the time of the Sahaba until until now, they say that this proves that there's a consensus or that the, the Muslimin agreed. Upon the fact that these uh, this urine and, and feces is is considered uh, tahir, because like we talked about last week and the week before, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, um, "With bawwana li Ibrahim a makan al bait and la tushrik bi shayya wa tahir baiti al taifina wal qaimina wa ruka al sujud." Or that He said, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and when we showed Ibrahim the site of the house, uh, saying to him, "Associate nothing with me and sanctify my house or purify my house for those who perform tawaf." And those who stand up in salat and those who perform rukur and sujood. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala ordered Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and then we know that we're ordered as well to keep the masajid clean and to keep najasa out of it. So the fact that the Muslimin never made an effort to remove these birds um, from the haram, um, despite the you know the thousands that there are, shows they say that this shows that it would be considered uh, considered tahir. Um, and then they also mention another hadith, which uh, I won't go into too much detail, just because the the um, the explanation about the authenticity is kind of a, a, a long topic. But the hadith about not using <coughs> bones or animal dung for cleaning oneself after they, one, someone goes to the washroom, um, uh, because in, in some of the hadith it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said that to not use these things because it's the food of your brothers from the jinn. So they say that this shows that it would be um, tahir because uh, he wouldn't permit the jinn to eat something that was najis. So, and I'll leave that out because there's already, like, I mean, there's more than enough evidence that we mentioned. Plus this hadith, there's some discussion about the authenticity of, of that part and also because someone might claim that uh, this is for the jinn. So there's there's some other ex- you know ways that people could reject so this is the first opinion and the evidences that they mentioned. So now we'll just talk about the evidence that's mentioned from the ones who say that it's najas. So the first evidence they mentioned is a hadith um, that the Prophet ﷺ passed, or it's from hadith from Ibn Abbas, that he said, مَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِقَبَرَيْنِ فَقَالْ إِنَّهُمَا لَيُعَذِّبَانِ وَمَا يُعَذِّبَانِ فِي, وما يعذبان في كَبِيرٌ أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَتِرُ مِنْ, من الْبَوْلِ وَأَمَّا الآخر فكان يمشي بالنميمة ثم أخذ جريرة رطبة فشقها نصفين فغرز في كل قبر واحدة فقالوا يا رسول الله لما فعلت هذا فقال لعله يخفف عنهما ما لم ما لم ييبسا. or from Abdullah bin Abbas that he said 
the Prophet ﷺ once passed by two graves and he said, um, uh, these two people are being punished and they are not being punished for something that was big or something that was major. Um, he said, And then he said, one of them never used to uh, cover himself or protect himself from urine and the second one used to go amongst the people and speak namima or backbiting or, you know, uh, however they translate uh, namima as. Something not, sorry, not big? Not big, like so. Meaning it's not, not meaning it's not a major sin. Meaning it's not, it's not something hard to not do. Like namima, all you have to do is close your mouth, and it's a small word. Like you might go and say something. Yeah, it's very easy to not, or it's a small thing that you're doing. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, uh, the, and it's just like covering yourself from from urine. Like all you have to do is, is do a little. Cleaning himself or, or protecting himself. Protecting himself. So meaning like that it would it would splash back and or would go wherever, and he didn't really care. Okay. So and then he and then and then so the Prophet ﷺ said this and then then he took a piece of green the green leaf from a date palm so he took the uh, like a leaf from the date palm that was still fresh and he cut it in half and he put one in each of the graves or fixed it on each of the graves and so they said O Messenger of Allah why did you do this and he said perhaps or or I hope that it will reduce some of what's upon them as long as um, as long as it doesn't become dry. Um, this hadith is agreed upon, um, and this is Al-Bukhari's phrasing, or one of Al-Bukhari's phrasings. So they use this, the way they use this is they say that the Prophet ﷺ didn't say his urine, he just said he didn't protect himself from urine. So this is all urine. It would mean every type of urine, whether it's from a human or from an animal, or from, you know, if it's yourself or from another human, like your baby, or I mean, any type of urine would fall under this hadith. So they mention this hadith, and then they, and, but... The reply to this hadith is that there's other narrations of the same exact hadith that say he didn't pr- he wouldn't protect himself from his own urine. So this hadith would explain the first one, which is the hadith that talks about his own urine would explain the hadith that just says urine in general, because one is a general phrasing; it would include everything. And we have another one that specifies no, it's 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 his and own. It's authentic. That's authentic as well. It's 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 uh, I don't remember if it's an Al Bukhari and Muslim or just one of them, but um, this is actually, I know, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's in both. So this shows that this hadith, yes, it's authentic, and yes, we apply the ruling, except for the fact that it's there's another hadith that shows that it's uh, it's specific to the person's own urine. Um, and then they also mention another hadith uh, from uh, from uh, Abu Huraira that he said uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, "أكثر عذاب القبر من البول," or that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Most of the punishment of the grave is due to urine." Um, and this is narrated by Ahmed and others. Um, and uh, the strongest is, opinion is that this is actually just from the Prophet, from Abu Huraira's statement. It's actually weak from the Prophet ﷺ. So this is what Abu Huraira himself said. But because it's something relating to the Akhirah, then we would say Abu Huraira wouldn't have said this if he didn't hear it from the Prophet ﷺ. Um, so this, they use this, and then there's another hadith that's weak from Ibn Abbas that's very similar phrasing. عَمَّةُ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ um, or sorry, yeah, فستن, من البول. Um, so they say that this proves that urine in general, any type of urine would be najas, because the Prophet Sallam here is saying that these people, people are being punished due to not protecting themselves um, from urine, and we have nothing to specify that it's the urine of a person or the urine of an animal that can't be eaten or an animal that can be eaten. So we have to stick to the general phrasing of this hadith, but the reply to this is that we have evidence that shows that what, what's meant by the adab al-qabr due to not protecting himself is the person's own urine himself. And then we have many, many evidences like we mentioned before that prove that it can't be including the urine of animals that can be eaten because we know that uh, the Prophet ﷺ told some people to drink it as a medicine mixed with milk and we know that the Prophet ﷺ took an animal into the haram, which is a camel, uh, knowing and doing tawaf, so it would have it, the likelihood of it into the washroom or relieving itself is very, very high. And the Prophet ﷺ permitted people to pray in the area of, of or in the pens of, of sheep, knowing that this is obviously where they stay, so there's going to be <coughs> urine and dung from these animals. So we can't st- have all this evidence and then say, but this hadith still means every type of urine because we're that means we're throwing away all these other evidences. Um, and not ex- not not understanding them with a correct understanding. 
Sorry, guys. Uh, about the Prophet Isa, he cut the leaf yeah. in half. And I used to hear What's that about? Like, like, uh, how is that getting yeah. reduced to half? Allah Alam, if it's because, I mean, we don't know for sure. He didn't say, could, could be because of the heat, maybe this would take something as like a coolant for it, you know, because, it, you know, it's there's some moisture in it. Because the Prophet yeah. mentioned it's as long as it's it's until it turns dry, but I mean, he didn't say so we can't say for sure. And was there like lots of leaves, or was there just the one? Is that way it kind of happened? Do we know anything more about this? It's all we know is that all we know is that. But some of the scholars said that this proves that it's good to plant trees around the graves of the Muslimin. Allah alam if that's correct, because did the Sahaba do that, understanding it or not? Allah alam. Like and that was a katamar tree, right? Yeah, yeah. Why don't we just say like that something that's Allah alam, like from the light that Rasulullah sallam. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Some try to go into it, and I mean, if if we have an evidence, then we would use it. Like it could be, it could be something like, for example, like you know, Rasulullah sallam gave that one Sahaba this day. Yeah. It could be something yeah, specific where, I mean, because he didn't tell the Sahaba to do it as well. Yeah. And if they didn't do it after him, the same thing, then it shows they didn't understand it as being something that should be followed. So that's why it's so important to look to how the Sahaba understood things because, I mean, we could start extracting things. Like you know, like 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 when we talked about the maulid before, like something that sure maybe it proves something, but it doesn't prove what you're saying, because someone could then say, well, no, this shows that uh, you know the best thing to do is eat tamar for an illness because this was a the leaf of a tamar tree and he put it for this and he put and then you start saying things or you should only build masjids up out of tamar tree like I mean or you can go give like a righteous person who gives have more evidence. exactly so like th- these <laughs> things like it's like well the sahaba saw it yeah. if they didn't do it why like who do you think you are to understand something from that that the sahaba didn't understand like uh, you, you know more than Abu Bakr or you know more than Umar or you know more, uh, more Uthman and Ali like this I mean you're opening up the door to say well yeah I understand the deen better than them you know what I mean? yeah so this is uh, some of the evidences that they use. <coughs> um, then they also mention um, the hadith that we talked about last week from Abdullah ibn, ibn Mas'ud um, when the Prophet ﷺ told him to go get him three rocks and he went and he came back with two rocks and, and the dung of an animal so for the Prophet ﷺ to, to clean himself um, and the Prophet ﷺ rejected it and he said this is riks or he threw it away and then he said this is riks or this is uh, impure, unclean. So they use this and show that uh, to say that he we don't know what animal it was, but the Prophet ﷺ said this in general. But last week we talked about the details of what uh, the rix means, and we said that this doesn't actually prove that um, this dung that the Prophet ﷺ threw away that it was considered um, najis. It was just that it was something unclean and it, that it's not allowed to use for uh, cleaning yourself. But to say that it's najis, there's no there's no clear evidence in that hadith to show um, to show that it's najis. I mean, another argument that they use is that when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Alladina yattabi'oon al-Rasul al-Nabi al-Ummi, alladina alladhi yajidoona hu maktuban 'andhum fi al-Torat wal-Injil, wal-Injil yamuruhum bil-Ma'roof wa yanhaahum 'an al-Munkar, wa yuhlu lahum al-Tayyibat wa yuharimu 'alayhim al-Khabaith." Or to say that the pro- or the, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says the, the meaning of which is those who follow the messenger, the prophet, who can neither read nor write, whom they find written in uh, with them in the Torah and the Injil, he commands them with the ma'roof or what is good. He forbids them from what is munkar or is evil. He allows them what is lawful from the or f- he makes lawful for them what is from the tayyibat. Um, or what is considered acceptable or pure or um, good and pro- prohibits for, from them al-khaba'ith or things that are considered um, khabith or considered uh, you know unclean or, or, or unpalatable or gross or something like that so they say here that because these things are considered gross to people this proves that they're haram and because it proves that they're haram it proves that they're najas and this is a very weak argument because we don't say things that are khabith in the shara'i way, or the, if that and meaning that Islamically they're considered khabith, unless we have a text from the Quran or the Sunnah. So if, if someone finds something disgusting, he has the right to think that that's disgusting, whether it's something to eat or a smell or that something the way something looks. That's a personal um, opinion or a personal taste, and that I mean everyone has the right to 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 that. But to say that because 
myself I consider this gross or where I come from we consider this gross this proves that it's haram in the sharia this is going too far um, and especially then to then say because it's haram proves that it's najis is even further because we talked about before not everything that is forbidden is considered najis um, because there's things that are haram to eat or drink that aren't considered najis um, but we would say everything that's najis is considered haram to eat or drink yeah uh, what I, uh, where did they get the ayah? Uh, Al-A'raf 157 And another question, Shaykh. So about the three rocks when the Abbas was there. Bin Mas'ud. 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 Bin
to eat. Their urine and their feces is considered najas. And birds, any la birds that are on land, so for example, like, uh, you know, that don't fly chickens, uh, roost, or sorry, uh, like, uh, whatever else there is, Ge uh, no, like geese, ostriches. <laughs> ostriches, anything like this, <laughs> that would also be considered, uh, those would be considered najas, but ones that fly, and they, you know, they, uh, they, they go, you know, they relieve themselves while they're flying or in the air, this would be considered tahir. So this, the, they, they take that opinion. So one's land animals is najis, but flying animals is tahir? Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. That's so what they claim. so yeah, anything that's on land, yeah. Anything that's on land is, is najis. And if they're flying, then it's considered tahir, yeah. Why? Because when they're falling, what's the evidence for that? They say because uh, w the urine and the feces, for when they're flying, it doesn't have a smell. Because there's wind, yeah? This is what they say, the animals that fly, or birds that fly, their urine and feces doesn't have a smell. Oh. Because something doesn't have a smell doesn't mean it's not natural. Exactly, so that's one thing. But I mean, and so, the, but, and what they, and they, so they use that also, then they use the fact that, like we talked about earlier, the haram has birds everywhere. So we need, they need some explanation to say that, well, why don't they wash this out? Why don't they yeah. get rid of the birds? Why don't they do something? Because, I mean, if you, for, if, if the birds have been there for, you know, over a thousand years... They could have been gotten rid of obviously in this time. Like even now, like if, if you know all the birds that are in the haram, if if they needed to and they you know sent exterminators in there, they could get rid of them easily. You know eventually they would get rid of them. But the Muslimin didn't put any effort, so they need some way to understand this. So they say, unreasonable. what's just a backup? Right? Like it's yeah, it's very unreasonable. Like, so like we we we, we would say that this is first of all the fact that it doesn't smell doesn't mean anything if it's like. Doesn't prove that it's not najis, like uh, Muhammad said. Yeah. That's the first thing. Second of all, how do you? I mean, if say for example, you you kept a bird, you were able to keep it in an area flying around, but so everything would land in one area. Eventually, it would start smelling. It's the same. It's the same uh, process in the body of of a, of a of like a chicken that doesn't fly, as opposed to like a you know pigeons that do fly. It's the same, essentially, the food that they're eating. It's the same digestive system, you know, with obviously some probably differences because it's a different animal. But in general, I mean, it, it would eventually smell. The reason we don't smell it is because it goes through the air. And, you know, I mean, if it doesn't, la if it landed on you, maybe it would have a smell. <laughs> Allahu <laughs> alam. Plus, plus why, like, so, but then to say that, if we look at it the other way and say, you know, it's just all birds and animals that we can eat, their urine is considered thought, and then we don't have to have these explanations. Exactly. And we say, well, that's the reason why they didn't get rid of them in the haram, because it's not najis to begin with. Whose opinion was this, Ahnaf? Ahnaf, yeah. Flying birds don't always yeah, relieve themselves while they're flying. They also sometimes land and re exactly. relieve themselves. So it's it's a very... I don't know. I don't know what they would say to that. <laughs> but it shows you how... Yeah. Sometimes the opinion is arrived at, and then when they see the evidence, they have to say, "Well, no, that means this." Instead of looking at the evidence and then arriving at your opinion, which is the correct way. So do you hear it's a way off topic? No, we'll leave it till after then. So this is the 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 this topic about animals that you can eat, and the evidence is for it. Myself, obviously, you know, I take that it's considered tahir. Um, and it seems like most of you did too as well Like the evidence is quite weak for the other side Especially the Ahnaf opinion It seems like it's You know it's the weakest of the three And uh, so yeah we'll stop, we'll stop there inshallah um, And if there's any questions about this, this topic